Okay, welcome to my Network Plus M10006. This is working on Chapter 4, Ethernet Technologies. So some of the concepts we're discussing today are going to be principles of Ethernet, and we're going to get into Ethernet switching features. So first, what are some of the characteristics of Ethernet networks in terms of media access, collision, collisions domains, broadcast domains, distance, speed limitation, and the various Ethernet standards? Also, we're going to be looking at what functions are per performed by Ethernet switching features such as VLANs. In this regard, we're talking about public VLANs, trunks or trunking, spanning tree protocol as it relates to a basic definition, link aggregation, power over Ethernet, maybe Ethernet over power, port monitoring, user authentication, and first hop redundancy. So before we can get into those deep questions, we need to get in questions like, where did Ethernet begin? It began in the uh, early 70s, uh, heavy development in the 80s and 90s, and uh, other technologies that kind of uh, were going on around the time were ArcNet, Token Ring, uh, Fiber Rings, but Ethernet pretty much defeated all of their competition, grew from them, and then emerged the primary communication standard of today's network. Originally, Ethernet ran over coax, which was 10 base 5 and 10 base 2 pair, but eventually it moved away from coax and went to twisted pair. So now what we see now is 10 base T, 100 base T, 1000 base T, and so forth. So, two components, uh, major components and philosophies for how devices uh, should be accessing the network as well as how to uh, share the media is deterministic, which means very organized. It needs the electronic token to transmit, and examples of that could be token link. And Against that is this contention based, which is more chaotic, transmits almost whenever you want, but no tokens required, and that's going to be our Ethernet. But there has to be some type of mechanism in place so that collisions don't occur. And when I say collisions, we're discussing things like two nodes talking at the same time. And the mechanism to prevent that is carrier sensing multiple access collision detection. So the carrier sensing means listen to the wire, verify it's not busy. Multiple access means all devices have access at any time. And collision detection, that's if two or more devices are transmitting at the same time, a collision may occur. So it's the mechanism that says back off, wait a random amount of time and try again. If another collision occurs, repeat. Back off, wait random time, try again. So if we are sharing a bus topology and one of our nodes wanted to talk, both of them could not talk at the same time. So by listening, we can prevent that. But if both were trying to talk at the same time, there would be a back off timer, meaning wait X amount of time. So our collision domain, if we are looking at specifically hubs, a hub is a multi-port repeater. So a hub, when it gets a signal from one uh, interface, it will clone it and put it all on all other interfaces. So we have one collision domain. If we are looking at a layer 2 switch, a switch does not repeat. It actually does forward selection. Here, each port that's connected to a node or connected to another device is its own collision domain. So we have some bandwidth capacity, and that's maximum line capacity. Ethernet is uh, 10 megabits per second. Fast Ethernet's 100 megabits. 
gigabit is 1,000 megabits or 1 gigabit, 10 gig is 10 gigabits per second, 100 gig is 100 gigabits per second, 40 gig is 40 gigabits per second, and so forth. So some of our Ethernet standards and their relative uh, component, 10 base 5, which is called ThickNet, it uses coax, it is 10 megabits, but can go up to 500 meters. 10 base 2 is also coax, but this is thin net, because it's thinner. It can go 185 meters. Base T, which is using CAT3 or higher, 10 megabits, 100 meters. If we are looking at 100 base T, that's CAT5 or higher, 100 megabits, also at 100 meters. 1000 base T, CAT6 or higher, or 5E or higher, we're still looking at gigabit speeds at 100 meters. 1000 base LX. LX is going to be fiber, and so that will be either multi-mode fiber or single-mode fiber. We are looking at 1 gigabit per second and roughly 5 kilometers. If we're looking at 1000 base LH, that's single-mode fiber, also gigabit, but the distance is 10 kilometers. Lastly, 1000 base ZX, again single mode fiber, gigabit speed, at 70 kilometers. This is only a few of several types. Moving on to our switch features. So Ethernet switching offers a variety of features to enhance performance. Things such as redundancy, security, manageability, flexibility, scalability, are just some of them. So some of the features we have to talk about are going to be VLANs, public VLANs at least, trunk and trunking, STP or spanning tree protocol, uh, link aggregation, EOP and PoE, monitoring, and user authentication are just some of the features we need to discuss. So we can have VLANs with basically a virtual switch port in the sense of, if we have a switch, we could then actually, we could have one physical switch, we could have these ports tied to one network, and these ports tied to a different network. And that is essentially a virtual LAN. So VLANs allow different logical networks to share the same physical switch. Instead of having dedicated switches to connect our devices, we can have one switch connecting to multiple LANs. So here's one network, here's another network, and both of them are going to one switch. So logically, they're two separate networks, even though physically they're one. So a trunk will allow each of these switches to communicate to a trunk. So this trunk allows for multiple VLANs to access it. So not a single VLAN, but multiple VLANs. So within our Ethernet frame, we do have our preamble, we do have our destination and source address, and, and uh, Ethernet type. But with Ethernet frames, with the 802.1Q information, we can have additional information, TPI and TCI. TPI is a tag protocol identifier. It's a six, normally a 16-bit field, and it is used to identify the frame as a 802.1Q tagged frame. This field is located in the same position as the ether type length field. And that's different from our TCI, which sets priority. So we could have a priority point. We could have a uh, VLAN identifier or VID. That way we know the appropriate VLAN that we are attached to. Spanning tree protocol helps us prevent loops. So if we have, oh, that's a kind of a weird switch. Our 
our three three switches connected and a broadcast starts happening broadcast will send out all active ports and so this switch will get it and it will broadcast that guy this switch will get it it'll broadcast that way but when this switch receives this guy it will then broadcast it back to him and just it will keep creating more and more and more broadcasts so what ends up happening is we end up with a switching loop where the loops could just be filled with broadcast traffic so STP is used to detect these uh, types of loops and to disable temporarily a active link we have two types of switches when we deal with STP a root bridge and a non root bridge a root bridge is a elected device that is in control of our spanning tree the switch with the lowest bridge ID should be elected the root bridge and the bridge ID is made up of a priority value and a MAC address so all other devices on the network switches that is not a root bridge will be classified as a non root bridge root bridge election will look at the priority and then the MAC address and whichever is the lowest number that becomes our root bridge then we have to start talking about well what about the ports how do the ports come into play so if we have a root bridge what do we call the ports that are connected to them so on the root bridge all ports leaving from it will be classified as a designated port the port with the lowest interface and lowest uh, MAC address that will be heading towards our root bridge will be called a root port so this guy should be able to communicate with that and so should this guy however since this is on G01 this will become the root port and this will become the non designated root port so this will be the link that goes down so if we actually change the segment cost like if this was now fast ether or if this was now ethernet and this was fast ethernet we're going to have a difference in cost so even though we can communicate both ways it will look at the cost of the link plus the port number and the lowest cost is going to win so instead of the bottom one being uh, disabled because this will turn to a non designated port this will get turned off so what are the different port costs these numbers I would not trust because they can be changed so do keep that in mind they're configurable STP has certain states that we need to discuss and they are a blocking state and that is where a PDU is received but not forwarded and it is used at the beginning of the process and on redundant links learning will process B PDUs and the switch will determine its role in the spanning tree listening will populate the MAC address table but does not forward the frames and then forwarding and that will just be a normal active port So all of this is to prevent broadcast storms. So one significant problem that can occur is if FTP is not working properly, uh, it can completely fail and can ca uh, cause broadcast storms. And a broadcast storm occurs when multiple switches receive broadcast frames and they just keep cloning to one another and keep uh, using more and more of these switches resources. Here's an example of R broadcast storm and they will just keep circling moving on will be our link aggregation 
and that is where we can combine multiple links so that we can share the bandwidth between those links. We have power over Ethernet. Uh, an old standard is 802.3AF. Now we have 802.3AT, and this will supply electrical power through Ethernet. And normally this combines two types of devices, a power sourcing equipment device and a powered device. Requires CAT5 or better. What do you power with PoE? It could be a phone. It could be a wireless access point. It could be lots of things. Anything that's going to be a network node that doesn't have the ability to have power close by. Port monitoring is, is another option. So what we can do with port monitoring is as regular traffic is going through the network, a port monitor could then start forwarding all the packets that it receives on uh, all the ports to a specific type of listening device, like a laptop with Wireshark. We could also authenticate, so before a user can, can actually connect to a switch, we could uh, authenticate our devices using 802.1x authentication. And that way we can secure communication when we plug into the network. That way, not a single type of device or person can connect without being authenticated keeping the network uh, network secure. And that's actually it for this chapter. I want to thank you.